it's live. So it looks like we're live. So hey, let's let's just kick this off. So we're live here with Rishi Patel from Plus Eight Equity. I uh, got to know him a couple months ago and just really blown away by just kind of the the sector that you're investing in and the community that you've been involved in. I think I opened up to you a few months ago. Like it's kind of what I wanted to do when I grew up, you know, kind of be in the in the music industry. Um, so like to live vicariously through other people and hopefully, you know, be involved in that community at some point. But um, but let's go deep, man. Let's talk about your background for the community. Um, some of the people on the line are emerging fund managers or entrepreneurs, people looking to break into VC. So we can just kind of freestyle it and kind of have fun with this conversation. But, um, you know, you and I went really deep on our stories in person, but I think it's good to hear uh, your story of how you broke into VC and also um, got involved with Plus 8 Equity and then also kind of the mu music ecosystem. So let's start there. Let's start where you went to school, you know, a little bit about your family and um, your knowledge of the private markets and then kind of how that career evolved. And I think you spent some time in banking as well. So let's kind of go sure did. Um, unpack that as well. You you bet. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Such a pleasure. And uh, hello to everyone else who's on the line. Um, you know, to be fair, you know, as I think about my career, it really starts with a passion, and it, and it certainly predates even where I went to school. Uh, you know, it, it goes back to my adolescent years. You know, I've always had a passion for music and creativity. Uh, I remember from the early days, uh, I was a guy who was really into going to concerts, uh, finding. Uh, the next record that was signed to an independent record label and, and things of that nature. Uh, it just so happens that uh, I was pretty good at math. So that sort of guided me, uh, you know, as I grew up and uh, when it came time to apply for colleges, uh, of course, coming from an Indian background, you get a lot of pressure, you know, apply <laughs> to med school, apply to med school, apply to med school. I'm yeah. sure you've heard that story. Well, real quick, uh, let me before. stop you there. So, Tell me the first concert that you saw. I can tell you mine too, but sure. like the first concert that you went to as an adolescent, what what, what concert was it? Who was playing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, it was Stabbing Westward. Uh, I was probably 14. Okay. Uh, I, it was at the Electric Factory in Philadelphia. Uh, I will tell you that I was a really skinny kid uh, <laughs> and I, I got my ass kicked. Uh, in the mosh pit, I think I lost my right shoe that evening, um, and, and I'll, I'll never forget it. But man, what a rush that was! And it, it really sort of was eye opening with regards to live music, the community around live music, and that connection between artists and fans. And that really was the first experience that that resonated with me. Yeah, mine was uh, Blink One Eighty Two. Nice so back nice. in like I think the uh, early two thousands, right? So. Um... So yeah, that, that's kind of, that was our prime as well. So that was my first one. So yeah, that that's yeah. awesome. And you know, growing up in Philadelphia, you know, we had some great bands that were coming through uh, and uh, you know, that was in high school. You know, I ended up going to school uh, at Penn, uh, which was in Philadelphia. So even in college, I got that great opportunity to mm -hmm. connect with uh, artists, um, you know, connect with, uh, you know, club culture, connect with, uh, people in the music scene, yeah, mostly as a consumer. Uh, and mm -hmm. to be honest, I never thought for one second I'd be working in the music industry in any capacity at, at that point. Uh, but it was really just uh, expressing my passion and connecting with the community uh, at that point. I'll say one more thing. I would say I resonate with you, right? So I, I think I told you, I opened up to you over a couple of drinks, like, I was in a punk rock band, like in, in yeah. high school, and um, my grades started going down. So my mom, like, kind of embarrassed me. She kind of, like, yelled at, yelled at me in front of, like, the people that I was playing in the band with. And they're like, Joel's not allowed to, uh, to play music anymore until he gets his grades up. So, um, so, yeah, that for me was kind of a little bit of a stigma to kind of, you know, be a good boy and, you know, become an engineer and, and get a good job. Um, but it's kind of still lingered with me behind the scenes, you know, I'm like, man, you know, maybe this is the time now to come full circle and like get back in touch in the music industry um, and see how all these things stitch together. But, you know, it, it's interesting to see how that stigma has been involved. You know, we got people, um, you know, of Indian descent now crushing it in Hollywood and in music. Um, I haven't seen too many people in the music sector. I've seen like a lot of Indian rappers, 
Uh, but you probably know a little more about that, you know, with, with you being in the industry. Sure. But I have sure. I've seen a lot of Indian, you know, rappers kind of make it from New York. Um, and then, you know, obviously we're all over TV. We're, yeah. we're in comedy now. So, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely happy to kind of see that huge evolution because that wasn't the case when I was in high school. It's kind of like looked down upon. It's like, oh, what's wrong with you? Like you're 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 doing things too risky, you know. Yeah, um, you should yeah. just be. You should just stick to like going to, like you said, right, going to med school or uh, getting a job in IT or being an accountant or something. Yeah, no, I, I resonate with those comments uh, very much. So, and you know, it's sort of in the purview of the societal pressures, the family mm-hmm. pressures, the expectations. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes I take a step back and I sort of connect with people across the board who are working, you know, various jobs. And I just see how unhappy they are, but I see this creative side to them. Yeah. And I sometimes, you know, I, I, I talk to them and I ask them like, have you ever thought about what could have been? And unequivocally it's again and again, yeah, I did think about mm-hmm. going to the music industry, but for whatever reason, society, family, you know, I had to sort of steer into a direction that wasn't necessarily my passion, but Hey, uh, it brought the bread home. Yeah. And, you know, I can, I can understand and, and certainly connect with that. But for me, you know, I, uh, my way of rebelling was to not go to med school and do something yeah. more business oriented, right? Because I wanted to steer out of that. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of thinking as I left, because I left high school, what's going to give me the most opportunity, the most flexibility uh, without really pigeonholing, uh, pigeonholing me. And so that was business. So I ended up, at, you know, heading to, to Penn's business school at Wharton. And, uh, you know, it gave me a lot of flexibility, you know, finance, business, it's so amorphous, it could be applied to any industry. And it just so happens, you know, as I said, you know, I, I was pretty good at math, you know, I, my, my parents are like, after, uh, you know, my senior year, go get a job, uh, you're not coming home, we paid a lot for your education, <laughs> uh, make it worthwhile. Uh, and uh, I did end up uh, joining a bank uh, called Morgan Stanley uh, on the investment banking side. And uh, I moved out west uh, to Miller Park, California. I was based uh, right in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, I was there for a couple of years doing technology mergers and acquisitions. And that was a hell of an experience. Um, and I was there uh, about two years uh, and I got promoted. And... Um, you know, I, I moved to New York when I was 22, which was really eye-opening for me. It was my first foray uh, living in a city of that caliber with that yeah. level of intensity. What were some of the biggest observations you noticed in the culture, like moving from the West Coast to the East Coast? I, I would say probably just a lot more hustle. And like, I would say like, I, I think both places are very competitive, but I think the vibe is much more of a hustle on the East coast versus like on the West coast, but I haven't lived in the West coast. So that's just me assuming. It it is a little bit of that. You know, what I will say is, you know, a place like Menlo park is really siloed around tech culture. Yeah. Um, Everything lives and breathes technology. You know, everybody sort of dresses the same. Everyone's got the Patagonia vest uh, sort of thing. I mean, it, it, it it was really, really a fascinating social experiment in, in a sense. Uh, look, a lot of smart people, you know, Stanford was just down the road. You had tons of guys from Cal Berkeley. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I did come across a lot of folks coming from East Coast schools. So it was sort of, yeah. it was a little lonely when I moved out there because it wasn't like a huge Penn contingent or sort of Northeast school contingent. And a lot of my friends, you know, if they left school, yeah, you know, they moved to New York, you know, yeah. uh, primarily and a couple of guys went to L.A., uh, mm-hmm. But I was sort of the the lone wolf in the Bay Area holding it down, uh, so that was it was challenging for me. But I sort of rose to that challenge. But I will tell you, when I did move to New York, I was so utterly grateful. I was really excited, and that energy, as you said, you know, it is it is truly a hustle mm-hmm. town. Uh, and, and tell me, so what, were you working in M and A in New York? Did you just transfer offices, or what uh, were you doing it, when well, you moved to New York? With, uh, it was all tech M and A. Okay. Um, so, you know, our, our technology practice, again, mm-hmm. focused on, you know, hardware, software, com equipment, you know, internet companies was based in Silicon Valley, just given the volume of deals, uh, yeah. the, the group had set out, uh, sat out there, but, you know, they, they split the coverage mm-hmm. geographically. So, you know, moved out to, to New York, I was still d- doing basically the same mm-hmm. thing, but covering a yeah. different set of clients. And just for the audience, 
you know, these transactions, it's usually, is it usually like a direct deal? And it's kind of like a late stage tech company. And then you guys are the investment bankers. So you guys will take a fee for, you know, raising that, raising that maybe series D round. Is that kind of how it uh, it, you know? it was, it was uh, most of the deals that we were doing were IPOs. Mm -hmm. uh, so even okay. later than what you've described, yeah. uh, you know, we were sort of taking companies that would are series D really at the earliest, but a lot of series E series F and a big venture back, uh, funds uh, yeah. were involved, whether it be battery ventures or otherwise taking them public and listing them on the NASDAQ, which was the primary conduit uh, uh, of a placement uh, for tech companies. And if it was a really big IPO and like I remember the first deal that our team was involved in was the Google IPO. You know, they went well beyond the NASDAQ and they listed directly uh, on the New York Stock Exchange because it was such a massive mega billion market cap company. So that was that was one element. But um, because I really was focused on mergers and acquisitions, a lot of what I was doing was doing, you know, sell sides, a lot of private company sell sides, um, you know, VC backed companies that were looking for liquidity uh, and looking for a strategic buyer, uh, because they just didn't have the scale or the revenue growth or, you know, whatever financial characteristics to go public. And so we were yeah. looking for a buyer for a number, number of them, you know, a lot of buy sides. Uh, and I'll tell you a lot of leverage buyouts. Um, and when I started banking in 2004, it was the first sort of era of the tech LBO. And this was yeah. sort of fascinating. It was a really interesting insight because uh, banks and creditors started getting more comfortable lending against cash flow. The SaaS business model started becoming a thing. And that's really where it started is around that time frame. Like, yeah, you know what? Maybe you can lend against recurring revenue, yeah. uh, subscription, cash flow streams. And it, so people were thinking much more progressively about transactions mm -hmm. at the time. It was a very, very interesting time to be in tech. Yeah, uh, around yeah that I mean, that's period. essentially what Pipe is right now, right? And then there's a yep. handful of other companies that you are bet. doing that. And, you know, the, the parallel is really the... Um, the, the collateralized debt obligations, right? Because people were selling and packaging securities based on cash flow from mortgages, mm -hmm. but because of the whole surge in tech companies building predictable revenue, it's easy to think of that as, you know, hopefully as predictable as a mortgage, but even better because, you know, hopefully revenues are three Xing or two Xing every year. Um, so it's not only a recurring stable, uh, predictable revenue for the most part, it, you know, hopefully if it's after like series A, but it's also appreciating over time, which yep. usually doesn't appreciate at that scale monthly uh, for real estate, right? So it's kind of an interesting uh, parallel. So yeah, yeah, no, and, and you know, so, and I live subprime, you know, I live mm -hmm. that sort of boom and bust. And I'll tell you, that was a, that was a, a weird time. Uh, yeah. Because at, at one point, on one hand, I was really concerned but I was also, you know, call it four or five years in. So I didn't have a family. I was yeah. a single guy living in New York. And, you know, like if, if stuff really hit the fan, I knew that I can call my mom. Yeah. And it was going to be fine. Just so go home to Philly, was, right? <laughs> just, just go home to Philadelphia. Yeah. So it was a different sort of set of circumstances for me personally. But I will tell you, it was a scary time for a lot of the partners. And I remember explicitly... Um, you know, walking down Madison, uh, Madison Avenue, and it was right after the Bear Stearns acquisition was announced. Yeah. And 383 Madison was literally covered in $2 bills uh, as, as a big FU to James Kane, the CEO, because he had sold what was, you know, one of the legacy companies of Wall Street for $2 a share to JP yeah. Morgan. I mean, it was such a wild time to wow. be on Wall Street. You know, it was a really, really fascinating time. But, you know, it was even like at Morgan Stanley, our bank was was not uh, was not immune to it. You know, our share price went from, you know, 45 bucks to 35 to 25 to 10, around mm -hmm. 10 bucks. I was like, you know what, maybe I need to look for another job. Yeah, uh, I, I ended up uh, interviewing with a couple of shops that were focused on restructuring, uh, which is sort of the, 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 the other side of the coin. Uh, when you're an M&A banker, you know, I ended up getting an offer with Mollus and company and Perella. And just given the culture of Perella being a lot of ex Goldman Sachs and ex Morgan Stanley bankers, I ended up joining them. And I was sort of doing almost exclusively restructuring assignments for a couple of years thereafter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I remember that time. I mean, at that time, I'd say, you know, even before the 
the recession, you know, I'd say 2006, 2007, it was really cool to be an investment banker. Like people prided themselves. Yeah. I lived, in, I lived yeah. in the city in my early twenties. And then, and then I, um, and then I went to grad school, but I remember being in, living in the city, like, a, you know, in my early twenties and people were just so proud of working like hundred hour work weeks. They just thought it was just the coolest thing. And they got car service to go home and all those people got burned out and they all left yeah. the banking industry. Yeah. Cause they were like, look, wow. You know, like, now it's all about experience. I think also after the recession, I think they had all these sharing economy startups and mm -hmm. people were all about, you know, uh, the experience, not owning, but, you know, saving yeah. your money, experiencing things. So I felt a lot of people were more conscious about work-life balance. Uh, mental health was a big thing. But, you know, a lot of those people switch gears. And as you see now, right, in the tech ecosystem, I mean, it's changing a little now towards the employer. But I would say probably like 18 months ago, you mm -hmm. know, the whole great, you know, the whole great resignation piece, um, you know, the the employees did have more leverage because they could be a little more picky and they they didn't want to settle for like a bad work environment. Um, I yep. think it's it's changing a little now with all the layoffs. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that dynamic. But um, yep. but I remember just kind of that change of priority for people that were working in the industry. Yep. to also have work-life balance. That that was a huge element to it. Uh, but that was also combined with the fact that because of things like TARP funding and government funding supporting mm -hmm. the banks, they had changed the entire compensation structure of the financial and services industry. Being a banker was no longer as lucrative. The CEO comps yeah. got cut. The banker pay got cut. And at some point, people were like, well, what am I working 120 hour weeks for? I'm not getting yeah. paid the same. So they started to look elsewhere. And that's really what changed the game, I think, in a mm -hmm. lot of ways to bring a lot of folks who were highly educated, highly motivated, super ambitious to start looking into more entrepreneurial type applications, i.e. startups or doing something that was actually making impact or, or what have you. So very interesting uh, mm -hmm. sort of dynamic there with the with the labor markets around that time. Yeah. OK, so then you did restructuring for some time. You kind of found your footing. In that uh, in that career, it seems like it wasn't too much of a disruption because you knew a lot of those people from past roles sure. and, and colleagues. So tell me about that, and then tell me kind of what happened after that. Yeah, I mean, I would say you know by the time you're sort of in banking five or six years, working crazy hours, um, you know, at some point you start hitting uh, a plateau with the learning curve, right? I mean, once you do you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten billion dollars worth of deals that every deal is, yes, nuanced in its, you know, ultimate manifestation. They're nuanced yeah. in the way they actually take, take, uh, take hold. But at the end of the day, the core principles of the finance and the modeling and the way you engage with clients is basically the same. Uh, to be honest, around year five or six, I started to get bored. And I was like, there's got to be something bigger than this. Uh, I was invited uh, at this, this is when I was at Perella in 2009. Um, I got a call from a friend of mine who, who said, hey, what are you doing this weekend? And I was like, uh, I don't even know what I'm having for lunch today. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> this weekend. Uh, and she said, you know, have you ever been to Berlin? And I said, no, I have not been to Berlin. And she told me the name of, of, a, of a music venue called um, Burkheim Panorama Bar which is sort of the mecca of electronic music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had never heard of it. So after lunch, I, I don't know, I went on Yahoo or something and whatever search engine was, was relevant then. And uh, I sort of uh, searched it and I was like, wow, this is some sort of like unbelievable venue for, for live music. So in short, you know, she invited me to come, you know, she was going to handle my guest list because apparently it's very difficult to get in. And I flew to Berlin for the weekend. And that was the ultimate game changer for me in terms yeah. of reconnecting with the purity of live music now we spoke about earlier that same sensation i had that first concert i went to when i was 14 in philadelphia i literally felt that sensation all over again you know yeah. call it 12 years later and it sort of reminded me of the youthfulness uh, uh of being a child and the, the creativity that i used to have and i was just like well what happened to me and i just sort of followed suit you know, I started traveling for music more and more over the next couple of years. 
Um, and over the course of my travels, I just started connecting in, in a very authentic and sincere manner with folks from the music industry. Because so I was just so off? curious. You, you take no. time off or you just kind of took vacations? No, I, no, no not, not none of the above. Yeah. I would fly to Europe for the weekend. So I would Got only it. go for, I mean, it was pretty brutal, but I was mm -hmm. a young kid yeah. and I could handle it. So, I mean, I would do, I would do Europe twice a month. For a couple wow. of years just for the weekend and, yeah, and I, 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 I didn't mention anything to work because they don't need to know what i'm doing over the weekend <laughs> yeah, it's, your, it's your own time it's my own time but i yeah. was yeah damn right i was in the office monday uh when you needed me uh albeit i was exhausted but you know i was there yeah um but that was really the big catalyst for me um mm -hmm. you know going to berlin and then just being re-inspired uh about music in, in a live music setting and that sort of started to alter the course of my career in a, in a pretty significant way. So walk us through kind of what was going on in your head. Yeah, you get to go to Europe, you're checking out a lot of, you know, cool concerts, but you still got this really great job in New York, right? So tell me kind of like, and maybe you haven't done this that often publicly live in front of everybody, but um, like what was going on in your head? Because you're like, okay, cool. I like music and I'm going to Europe because I love music. Right. But like right. what else was going on? Were you thinking, hey, I, I think I should do something in the music space. Like, tell me how that kind of evolved, like and how long that took to kind of like it, finally push it, you over. it took it took years. And honestly, it wasn't it wasn't something I could do myself. Yeah, because, um, you know, I started traveling a lot for music. You know, this was like 2009 you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12. And, you know, my travels got more and more intense as to where I went. I mean, I was going to Japan yeah. for the weekend. I mean, wow. I was doing some un unbelievable stuff, stuff that maybe no man has ever done. <laughs> uh, in either case, you know, at some point, you know, you know, a couple of years into it, I'm like, this is really cool. I love this industry. I love the community. Clearly, this culture is um, very well suited for me. Maybe there's a way to work in this industry. And, and then I started questioning, like, okay, if I did, if I did work in the industry of music entertainment, in what capacity would I do it? You know, am I going to quit my, my, you know, lucrative banking job to be a DJ, you know, to be an artist manager, to be a label manager? You know, the first thing that crossed my mind is that my mom's going to flip. You know, she's yeah. going to freak out. Uh, she's going to think that I totally went AWOL and yeah. uh, have lost my mind. Uh, so that was the first consideration. Yeah. So it took me a couple of years mm -hmm. um, to me really figure out, you know, what would make sense for me to do. Yeah. What was and the low hanging fruit? Was it events? Was it like being the, a creator? The, the, the low hanging fruit in terms of a new opportunity for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like the low hanging fruit to kind of think about how you can transition. Because you mentioned a few things, right? You said like, possibly doing events, like being, right. you know, being an actual creator and like learning how to compose or something or so like what were like the first maybe the, 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 the low kind of... the low hanging fruit would was literally just to start learning to DJ. Oh okay. Um, Got and it. and I and I'll tell you around that time uh, I bought turntables on eBay. Yeah. I got a great deal and I just mm -hmm. when I was home I just I turned you know I was on YouTube you know every yeah. day after work learning myself how to how to play. You know, and then I started doing gigs around New York City. So mm -hmm. I sort of had this like other side to me. I would work yeah. really, really hard during the day, and I would be a I would be a creator performing in a live performance setting around different venues in, mm -hmm. in New York City. And uh, you know, I, I'm mm -hmm. grateful to be a perform you know at perform at some of the top venues in New York. Yeah, but so I you're mean, like a mini David Solomon, pretty much, right? Because yeah. <laughs> <Solomon's on. laughs> well, yeah, maybe not as well accomplished, um, <laughs> but you know, in in a, in a way, it just was sort of following following your passion yeah but I, but but i i sort of was thinking like well, that's all great to be a dj but it's a pretty saturated market and that's mm -hmm. that that takes a whole it's a whole like commitment if i if i want to take yeah. it seriously and you know lo and behold um you know i met this guy in uh in ibiza in 2012 uh, who's my current business partner today uh this just gentleman gentleman named richie houghton and, um, you know, he really blew my mind because he's one of the progress most progressively minded technologists in the music industry. Um, and he's been involved in some of the leading sort of um, technology companies. Uh, he's been involved in some of the, the leading sort of you know, thought um, 
you know, thoughtfulness uh, on where the music industry should go uh, as it's shaped increasingly by the integration of technology and influenced by technology. And, you know, I started touring with him a couple of times here and there, and we became really, really good friends. And it wasn't until October of 2013 where he introduced me to his first business partner uh, that dates back to the first time they started a record label out of Detroit when techno first started. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a gentleman named John Aquaviva. Uh, both are Canadian and both came out of Ontario. And uh, they sort of connected uh, around the time that, uh, you know, there was a new musical movement coming out of D Detroit called techno. And they started a label called Plus 8 Records. Name sound familiar. You know, our firm yeah. is named after Plus 8. Uh, and the name plus eight is derived from the Technic 1200 turntables. So when you would change the playback of the record, you could you can move it from minus eight to plus eight to change the pitch on the record. So when you played something at plus eight, it made pushing the parameters to the limit, playing mm -hmm. a record as fast as it could. So it was about the evolution of music through technology. That was the theme. And that's sure. what embodied plus eight as a record label. And, you know, they had a lot of success in the 90s. And, you know, when I met John in October of 13, I was blown away about the fact that you know, he started doing angel investing uh, at that sort of cusp of that, you know, change of uh, the music industry from analog to digital. So when that paradigm shift from analog to digital happened, you know, you had to really throw away the economics of the traditional music industry and reinvent uh, your business with digital revenue streams. Mm -hmm. And the, the techno guys, you know, no surprise, being the most progressively minded about technology, embraced the technology. They embraced the future. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I met him, you know, he started telling me about all the investments they were doing at the time, uh, you know, when that century went into the digital world. And there were two notable ones that, um, that you know, he was responsible for. So the first one was a technology called Final Scratch. So if you ever see the laptop in the DJ booth, mm -hmm. that was discovered by my partner um, to get DJs comfortable playing digital files. And this was around the wow. era of, of iTunes. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge, the challenge for our community is like, that's cool that you can play digital files, but where do you get the music? Because we're not playing Miley Cyrus or Bruno Mars. We're playing esoteric records coming from independent music labels from Romania, from New York, from London, from Paris. And so they founded and invested in a company called Beatport out of Denver. Mm -hmm. And Beatport's still one of the mo you know, foundational uh, platforms um, for bringing together the community around, uh, around new music um, for, for electronic music. And so, you know, they had invested that in 2004, John had sat on the board and they grew that to about 50 or 60 million in sales. They had an offer from a then public company called SFX. Um, and they sold the business and they were liquid. You know, it was right around the time uh, that I met John. And, you know, when mm -hmm. he approached me, it's like, look, we've been investing in the space for entertainment tech for the last 10 to 15 years. We had a huge exit and we'd like to keep supporting our industry and investing in it. Now, the big problem that we have is that building syndicates of investors is a challenging because yeah. music people are not very reliable. Um, you know, they're often pretty flaky uh, mm -hmm. and they do things on a very ad hoc manner. And I'm scratching my head as a Wall Street guy. It's like, this is so stupid. Why don't you guys just start a committed fund that's completely focused on deploying capital in entertainment tech of which music technology should be a pillar and yeah. you know he responded i have no idea how to do that and at which point i responded <laughs> step into my office let's talk <laughs> and the the rest is kind of history yeah. uh, that was really the first conversation that we had around the idea of bringing plus eight records into the new paradigm uh, or as an investment fund to support or supporting creators in the en entertainment space. Yeah, so I had uh, Andrew Jarus from XPV Ventures. Um, he mm -hmm. he works for Kevin Hart. Uh, he also manages Heartbeat Ventures. So he was telling me a little bit about just kind of how the entertainment ecosystem is and how they think about investing, right? And you know, you've also 
built some deep connections in the music space. Um, you know, obviously some of the big names that you and I have mentioned, I'm not sure if we're allowed to mention them, but um, you know, some of those well-known artists, they're also building their own firms and deploying yep. capital. So tell me how they're thinking about their career, right? Is there an identity crisis where they don't want to be musicians for the rest of their life and they also want to kind of have other baskets where they also become investors and they also want to invest in tech? I guess maybe just from a high level, maybe just tell me kind of like where their thought process is in terms yeah, of like how they want to evolve a, their legacy. Yeah, it, it's it, it's a couple of things and that's a really good question. Uh, you know, we're, there seems to have been a trend in the last couple of years of high profile celebrity types, whether you're a musician or an actor or an athlete to get more involved uh, in the investment game. Um, I think that part of it is an identity crisis uh, as, as you sort of eloquently put um, mm -hmm. specific to, you know, what, what I interpret that is, you know, I can't do this forever. Uh, you know, I've got sort of my, you know, call it 15 years of fame or whatever it might be. But, you know, when I'm older, I need something that I can fall back on. Right. Sort of like an athlete. Yeah, um, I think that's an element to it. But I think a bigger element to it, to be honest, Joel, is that a lot of these guys are freaking out because everyone else is doing it, uh, especially, uh, you know, if you if you sort of get an insight into the way like L.A. culture works. It's mm -hmm. very much, it's very much that like, oh, that musicians, see, they, they started a fund. How come I don't have a fund? You <laughs> yeah. know, I need to get involved. So, and it's, a, it's so you'd say it's a little bit of, of a FOMO? It's, it's, it's I, a little, little bit of a FOMO is an understatement. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a much, it's, it's yeah. very much a FOMO. That's a very big part of it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's been an impetus for a lot of uh, people in the entertainment industry to come, uh, you know, full circle on the investment. Mm -hmm. Now, th now the challenge here, Joel, is that their artist managers haven't a clue how to do it. They, you know, they are they are professionals that know how to manage an artist. That includes mm -hmm. building his brand. That includes yeah. setting up the tours and working with the agents. You know, various projects around uh, you know, new album releases whether it be brand partnerships, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have a clue. You know, you throw him 10 startups and you say, hey, which one should I invest in? They don't have a clue. They're not yeah. qualified for that. These, these guys aren't HBS grads. Sure. And so, you know, we well, sort what of- I've seen, what I've seen with like Serena Ventures and some of these other, um, you know, athletes and celebrities, um, they've, I think they've retained talent, like maybe someone who used to be a GP at a fund or someone that yes. worked in yes. private equity. And that person, and I think that's what happened with, um, you know, some of the people I've spoken to. So they just find the talent to kind of de help to deploy the capital. Yes. And then and then the musicians and the artists, obviously, they have the brand um, to kind of back that. Yes, that, that that's very much what's happening. We're seeing that yeah. more uh, with the big athletes than the, than the mm -hmm. bigger musicians. And you're not seeing like Metallica do this. You're not really seeing yeah. like Aerosmith. You're not really seeing some of the bigger hip hop guys do this. Some of them are. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like a Kevin Durant, you know, he's got his own, he's got his own fun, you know, Serena, yeah. you know, I, and also it helps that, you know, she's married to Alexis Ohanian, yeah. who's a, you know, a tech entrepreneur, he understands the investment game. Um, so it, with the athletes, it's much more, you know, panning out and unfolding in that manner. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say on the music side, it's still kind of nascent. Uh, it's happening here and here at an ad hoc basis. And we, we kind of saw, well, there's a niche here for a plus A to start bringing together um, some of these A-list guys, both mm -hmm. on the DJ side or pop music side. And again, I, I want to be respectful of their names. So I'm, I'm not going to publicly disclose them on this yep. call. But like, you know, they sort of said, like, you guys are doing this 24-7. Your whole job is to evaluate the, the ecosystem of deal flow. We want in, you know, and mm -hmm. if there's a deal that... Uh, that you know you really like you know would you tell us about it like yeah absolutely we'd love to get you involved if you want mm -hmm. to do it you know outside of the fund you know it's we give those you know our own lps almost like a right of first refusal to get into the deals with us and we support yeah. that so we carved out a really unique business model that we just hadn't seen before uh in the entertainment space at that time and it's worked out really really well you know now that we're sort of nine years deep yeah, I know that's really, and I think there's two options, right? So there's options for people to get an index of deals through just kind of investing in your fund, um, you know, as an LP. And the benefits of that is number one, the education, the community of other like-minded LPs. 
Um, so I think those are the benefits of being an LP, right? Just meeting other people that you didn't know that do definitely have a level of sophistication. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, optionality to also, usually as a perk, there's optionality to co-invest. And then I think if you can, you can also, I think strategically for fund managers, they can spin off mini SPVs just to get some interest and get some activity going uh, with some people that are not LPs yet. So I feel like SPVs are almost a lead gen to kind of get that interest and help yep. people understand the, the industry, understand your investing style, and also know about these different types of opportunities. So it's kind of a win-win. And then, and then I think another model, which I've seen is some people may just want to white label their brand and just have like a fund as a service. You know, they don't have the time mm -hmm. or expertise. Like you said, their manager has never managed money. You know, they can get, a, they can get, you know, 10,000 people in a room for a, con a concert, but they haven't deployed capital. So, um, you know, having somebody be their fund as a service, I think it'd be really cool, especially if it's a fund that is in that industry and really knows the um, the sector. And then also has a network of all the other musicians and, and like-minded LPs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely spot on. I think all of those uh, various models are coming to fruition at people's comfort level, right? And mm -hmm. at people's sort of, you know, uh, ability to allocate time and resources to whatever model uh, and also people's capabilities. Um, so it's a couple of pieces to that. And I think what something that people overlook is the investment game isn't just deploying the capital. The majority of my time is, okay, now that I've sent the check, now what? How do I manage this asset? Mm -hmm. uh, and how do I ultimately get a return on it? So I spend so much of my time at board meetings, you know, opening up the network for our portfolio companies, um, helping to broker partnerships, um, you know, helping them connect with you know, prospective investors. And now that we're sort of you know, in uh, a phase where we're getting a lot of strategic interest, you know, helping to broker um, the sale or liquidity event for these companies, right? That's a whole process. And let me tell you- Yeah, but that's so, such that's a, a huge, that's such a huge advantage that you have. I mean, you essentially can- like literally take somebody to exit. I mean, just through probably your past uh, contacts, but then just your knowledge of that, the mechanics of that. Because a lot of times VCs probably, especially emerging managers, they've never they've never gone down that road. You've done that time and time again in yes. your past life. So I feel exactly. like that's a huge asset that you have, like personally. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a massive asset that we have because we have mm -hmm. all the M&A capabilities in-house. Not only, not only do we have it in-house, we know who all the buyers are in our <laughs> space because we we're on first name basis with you know the presidents and CEOs of the top you know companies out there. So yeah. you know it's sort of like a, you know it, it's a really really elegant model that uh, that we sort of stumbled upon um, through sort of trial and error, uh, but it's worked really really well for us. Uh, and I, I I think it's worth mentioning that. You know, in the last couple of years, as the music industry has become more than music and, and started to intersect with gaming, right? Putting mm -hmm. Travis Scott into Fortnite, um, you know, intersect with health and wellness. Music's become much more than music. And so we've slowly expanded the scope of our fund um, to, enca to, to encapsulate these other opportunities. Now, now we're yeah. sort of looking at you know, music tech, gaming, creator economy, consumer tech, and then more recently, very aggressively at Web3 enter, uh, Web three applications into entertainment. You know, all this stuff is sort of fair game for us, even though the DNA and the foundation of what we started with was music tech, music has become more than music. And we have to, we have to embrace that and, and we continue yeah. to do so. Yeah, like my initial thoughts on music tech, I mean, there was a company that I looked at like maybe three, four years ago. And what, what it would do is it would digitally remaster music uh, automatically, where normally you'd have to send it to somebody to kind of remaster yep. music, but it would use some AI. So maybe just in the pure music industry sector, can you talk about just some innovations? And then, you know, we the previous guest that just came on, you know, we started going deep on GPT-3, right? So now there's mm -hmm. a whole generative AI. I mean, so couple things I would say is, you know, the music mastery was really interesting, but now what's crazy is, you know, there's technology out there where if somebody, you know, I do have hours and hours of content. So if somebody were to synthesize all of my audio for probably maybe, I don't know, 20 hours worth, you could probably take any song 
and like have me rap to it without me there. Like, and there was a guy, I don't know if you know Sam Parr, but he's like a redheaded Caucasian guy. He he runs the <laughs> podcast, mul- he, he runs the podcast, My First Millionaire. And okay. um, there was a Biggie Small song that like had him rap to the Biggie song, but it was okay. completely AI. So like it took hours and hours of listening to his audio. So I think yep. at some point, there's going to be songs that are completely generated like through AI. And yeah. I think, and I don't know if you're like really bullish on that, but just in the generative AI space, I think you can create, I think you can like compose songs um, and then also like have people be on features uh, and like be guest rappers when they never actually did rap. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I think the, uh, the foundational comment uh, behind everything you just said was and is how do you democratize the creator with tools mm-hmm. to yeah. to make to elevate his abilities right how do you make it so you know i just create a song um i don't have the financial means to pay someone 300 to 3000 dollars to get it mastered but mm-hmm. is there an ai solution that uh, is able to do it yes there is in fact we're invested mm-hmm. in one out of montreal called lander which are sort of the the number one name name of the game sort of technology platform around AI mastering, but also creator tools for for musicians. You know, uh, to, to your comment, you know, what are some of the stuff that we're involved in around purely mm-hmm. music? You know, some of our first investments were this. You know, and then the market was was sort of at that stage before it's sort of diving into this mm-hmm. intersection and convergence of music and gaming and so forth. But at that point, when we had launched our fund. You know, we are invested in companies like Slice, which is, you know, at, at a Series D now, uh, and, and Lander, which is a leader in the market. I mean, these are the leading tools that creators are using, generated huge amounts of revenue right now uh, in a way that we never thought possible. Uh, democratizing the creator, you know, doing things on a, you know, call it, call it a subscription basis to provide mm-hmm. samples or tools to allow people to create music. So it's really, really exciting. Further to your comment about, AI music, you know, I absolutely think very much so that that's the direction things are headed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting platforms that are helping musicians in interesting ways. You know, they're sort of AI generating melodies, AI generating beats, and you can put in some human input that allow you to sort of make it customized to suit your own creative um, mm-hmm. abilities or your creative creative direction rather. So it, it's a very, very exciting time. But again, that's very much siloed into yeah. you know, the creator for music. It's not a massive, massive market, which is mm-hmm. why we did a few handful of investments, but we've looked more broadly about how music, you know, AI is touching like health and wellness, for example, or you know, how music is touching the automotive sector. And we're trying to think much big, bigger picture about music applications into the broader global ecosystem. Yeah. And then I would say like just as a music fan, something that I've been really excited to see is um, more ad hoc music. So I don't know if you know, like Mark Rebier, I think he's in Texas. Um, he pretty much just does everything improv. Like he'll come in, he'll create a melody and then loop it. And then he'll create a mm-hmm. beat and then he sings and raps on top of it. But every single performance is completely unique. And I started seeing Ed Sheeran do this too. So Ed Sheeran, a lot of his songs um he'll actually he's done some cool stuff with loops so he'll actually create a beat and it's like a loop and then on top of that loop he'll do like a guitar strum Mm -hmm. and then that's kind of like the chorus so i've been seeing a lot of cool stuff like that just now as live um content is more um spontaneous and like ad hoc versus kind of like playing your typical album that you've had so i don't know if you've i don't know if you've seen that a lot but like i've started to see that a lot um, with like just live uh, live content, but I don't know if that's kind mm-hmm. of a trend or if that's just more of just a one off with like some musicians doing that. I, I think it is a trend. Um, yeah. I think in in the context of live performance, mm-hmm. the new generation of music is much more adept to start using software and hardware yeah. in the context of their live performances. So mm-hmm. yes, they still use the guitar and they have a drummer and all of these other things, but they're using also you know, Ableton, they're also using, you know, some sort of hardware that it has a controller around that digital audio workstation. So it starts to get more sophisticated and elegant and bending the parameters and extending the parameters of what you traditionally thought possible. So it's a very, very exciting time, I think, for musicians, not just in the studio, 
but on stage as well. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Well, I know we got 10 minutes left. Um, so, you know, if anybody in the audience has questions, we can try to tackle those. And, um, you know, in the meantime, maybe you can just share as we wrap up, maybe just share kind of a life lesson. I mean, you've shared so many. Um, and it looks like we got one or two questions in here, but um, maybe just a life lesson that you've learned from a mentor. You've met so many amazing people that have influenced your life, but just kind of looking back, what's kind of a life lesson? I think one of them is really just not ignoring what gets you excited and, you know, that feeling that you get. Uh, so that passion, but like, what else, what, is, what else is yeah. kind of a, maybe a life so, lesson? So that's definitely at, at the top. Uh, number mm -hmm. two, stay humble is, is a big one. Yeah. Uh, and number three, you know, one of the guiding principles for me have been get really good at something, put mm -hmm. in your, you know, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 hours, and then apply it to something you love if you can. Yeah. And that way, you know, you are the ninja in your market. And, mm -hmm. you know, and for me, it happened almost serendipitously, right? You know, getting really good at finance, having a lot of transaction appearance, but I was like, shit, man. I can apply it to music. I just didn't know how at the time, but I figured that out. Yeah. You know, and I was tenacious about it. And here I am. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think to break into VC, you know, there's so many parallel roles that support a fund. Like if you're good at accounting, you can do some fund admin for VC. If you're good at sales, you could do fundraising. So, you know, you may not directly be in an investing role in the beginning, but you can use yes. some of those superpowers to kind of at least be in the, in the industry. And then, you know, you may just be one seat away right. from someone who is on the investing right. team and you never know, maybe right. they, maybe there's someone that just departed the firm and yeah. there is an yeah. open headcount and you could just kind of take, you know, because you've known the industry and the company so well, that's that, kind of absolutely. an easy way to jump in. So, yeah. And I, and I'll, and I'll tell you, uh, there is a trend right now for funds to get more sector specific and get more specialized because, you know, they're the ones that can um, defend their value proposition, mm -hmm. right? The, the jack of all trades of, you know, the major behemoth mega funds, that is so competitive. That's not even a space I'd even want to get into, right? Because there's a, so much capital and it's utterly saturated. But in our space, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's not that many guys that can do what we do. You know, we know our space so well. We know all the guys in it. And we were sort of the first guys doing it in, in, our, in our space. And it, lo and behold, what was originally a niche market sort of blew up. Uh, and so we're pretty well positioned, uh, you know, moving into the next couple of years. It's, it's a very, very exciting time. That's amazing. And I, I guess we had one more question, then I guess we can wrap up. So Mason, you had a question on entrepreneurship through acquisition. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Rishi. Uh, Hey, so it was an amazing discussion. Uh, th thanks for sharing your, your experience. My I, I came from the startup background. I'm uh, part of the uh, VC fellowship program at Southern Capital. So uh, I'm kind of building my way into the PE uh, VC world. Uh, I was just curious, what are your, knowing things that you know today, what are the three tips that you have for some emerging uh, entrepreneurs that they're trying to become entrepreneurs through acquisition as opposed to like building startups? Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I would say, number one, know your space. Um, uh, network like crazy. Um, and, and then I would say, uh, surround yourself well, by a great team um, that, will, that you will learn from. Um, and it, it, it is sort of broad, but those are principles that have really guided me through my career. Uh, in any capacity. So, you know, I, I wish you the, the best of luck, uh, you know, and always here if, if you want to reach out to me, uh, if you want to chat offline uh, and happy to give sort of my, my two cents uh, on, on, a, on a more, more, more deeper level. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll reach out to you on, like, on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Yeah, thank feel you. free anytime, anytime. Cool. Well, Rishi, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And all that you do and uh, excited to hear, you know, the journey that you had. I, I think we definitely went a lot deeper than our, uh, our discussion, but um, hope to catch up soon. Thanks for yeah. coming out, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago and uh, I'll have to come out to Miami soon. You bet. If anyone's uh, in South, uh, South Florida, give me a shout. I would love to grab a coffee. Thank you for the time, Joe. I had a great time.